Okay, time to write that Top Cat movie review. Let's see... Hmm... Usually that doesn't mean much, but do I really want to start the new year like this? Yeah, let's do that instead. If it's always once upon a time in New York City Why does my fault find you feeling so Kicking off the second half of the season, I'm going to watch a cat movie that I know and like. Oliver and Company. Don't worry, I'm not dropping Top Cat. It'll be done after the next set of requests. As for what we're looking at today, I thought it was a Disney movie with an original story. But in reality, Oliver and Company takes its inspiration from Oliver Twist, one of the most favorite stories from English writer Charles Dickens. The director for this movie is George Scribner, who served as an animator for Heavy Metal, Heidi's Song, and even The Black Cauldron. He also directed the Disney version of The Prince and the Pauper and Mickey's Philhar Magic, and this was the first movie overseen by Jeffrey Katzenberg, who had the idea of adapting Oliver Twist in the first place. That said, Pete Young of Paramount Pictures wanted to have dog and cat characters for the story. Let's see how that turned out as we visit Oliver and Company. We open in New York, and yeah, I know, the movie came out in 1988, so let's not linger on that. Love the hand-drawn visuals so far, though. Anyway, there's a box of kittens, with each costing five bucks! Though it seems like people are just taking them for free, because we don't see anyone paying. In the end, only one kitten isn't adopted, and that turns out to be our title character, later named Oliver, voiced by Joey Lawrence. He is left all alone in the freaking rain, and nobody is bothered to take him to a shelter? If it's always once upon a time in New York City. Well, if you can afford it. Especially nowadays when everything is super expensive and falling apart. It's very sad to see this kitten all alone in the freaking rain. To make matters worse, he almost falls into a sewer and is chased by wild dogs. It's a nasty life out here, and you immediately sympathize with Oliver since he's a defenseless cat and deserves better. The only thing missing right now is a substitute for Mr. Bumble. What? The morning isn't any better when Oliver is still ignored. He tries getting food from a hot dog vendor, voiced by Frank Welker, only to be shooed away for his troubles. All the while, this suave-looking dog looks on. And this turns out to be Dodger, voiced by Billy Joel. He's one of my go-to artists on the radio, even to this day. So let's see how he fares as a voice actor here. I sure picked the wrong guy to get hot dogs from, kid. Get, get away from me! Oh, chill out, man. I don't eat cats. It's too much fur. So in the book, Dodger was a pickpocket who swung between using Oliver for his own ends and pitying him. He was also a kid in a few other adaptations. Consider yourself at home. While here, he sounds more like an adult. Regardless, we see his less likable side when he manipulates Oliver into getting food for himself. Without sharing. Wait, you're not being fair! Fair's a for tourists, kid. Consider it a free lesson in street savoir faire from New York's coolest quadruped. What an asshole! At least this leads into one of my favorite songs in the movie. Why should I worry? just feel Billy Joel get into it during these parts. I also like the CGI in certain parts, which was mostly done with a new team of animators like Glenn Keane and Mike Gabriel. And now that I think about it, this really makes the city feel like a dog's playground at the expense of cats like Oliver. Anyway, our title character tracks Dodger down this boat by the docks where we see more characters. The Chihuahua is named Tito, voiced by Cheech Marin. The Bulldog is Francis, voiced by Roscoe Lee Brown. The Great Dane is Einstein, voiced by Richard Mulligan. And the Saluki is Rita, voiced by Cheryl Ralph. Of these four, only Rita has a book counterpart, and you'll know why soon enough. Turns out Dodger lives with those dogs, and the sausages are for them. When asked how he got them, he spins a story how he had to fight Oliver, who he describes as such. A greedy, ugly psychotic monster with razor sharp claws dripping fangs and nine lives all of them hungry 
Really? He's a kid! It'd make more sense if he were older, but come on! Oliver is eavesdropping all this time, but then crashes in on accident. The dogs are all spooked for a moment, until they realize what he is. Jeez, you guys are so mean. He's just a kitten. But the dogs calm down when they realize why Oliver was here. I, I just wanted some of the sausage they helped him get. Hey, kitty, what took you so long? Relax, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, Dutcher, top dog has to get help from my cat. Well, if you shared even one bit of the sausage, Oliver wouldn't be here. This argument causes a dog pile and a little roughhousing, at least until their owner shows up. Don't you understand? Sykes will be here any minute. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, the rare Disney Dom DeLuise character. This is Fagin, directly inspired by the book character of the same name. That Fagin led a group of orphaned kids who did his doing. But this version is just a homeless man who's trying to survive. His design also resembles that of his book counterpart with the red hair and large nose, both of which were associated with Jews back in Charles Dickens' time. Whether or not they carry over the anti-Semitism, I can't say for sure. Anyway, this Fagin seems to be having trouble with another character, Sykes. Who could that be? Well, that guy has two bodyguard dogs who first show up called Roscoe and DeSoto, voiced by Toreen Black and Carl Weinstrom, respectively. But then we get a good look at Sykes once Fagin makes his way to his car. Money, Fagin. Actually, I've got something much better than money. Some luxury items. Ah, yes. Bill Sykes, voiced by Robert Logia. In the book, he was the lead villain who worked alongside Fagin. Here, he's a loan shark that Fagin owns money to. Unsurprisingly, for someone in that line of work, he has ways to deal with those who can't pay. Do you know what happens when I don't see my money, Fagin? People get hurt. People like you get hurt. Now, Sykes might not have Gaston's charisma or Cruella's charm, but his menace comes from being someone who's not far off from real life. He is every capitalist businessman that takes advantage of the poor and downtrodden by putting them in no-win situations and sucking them dry. Sykes would not mind killing Fagin right now, but he does give Fagin three days to pay up or else. The bad dogs are as scummy as their owner, Roscoe hits on Rita, which alludes to how Book Sykes was in an abusive relationship with Rita's book counterpart, Nancy, which ends up killing her. That probably isn't going to happen in this Disney adaptation, but we'll see. Anyway, DeSoto finds Oliver and has to be an asshole about it. We gotta go. I like cats. I like to eat them. Well, what did you expect? That this kitty won't resist when backed into a corner? Dodger and crew defend Oliver just as the bad dogs are forced to leave with Sykes. Guess this means Oliver's part of the gang now. They also tend to Fagin as he mopes about his situation. <laughs> I saw DeSoto's nose. Who did that? You? <laughs> that took a lot of guts. We've never had a cat in the gang before. We can use all the help we can get. Well, better late than never. Even though Oliver is getting that dog owner treatment, at least Fagin is truly compassionate towards him and the dogs. They're like one big family that supports each other even when times get rough. And the dogs themselves are also starting to treat Oliver like one of their own. The next morning, Fagin and the animals ride through New York on a motor scooter. They should honestly consider collecting trash like in Yakuza Like a Dragon, because that'll score them big bucks. Oliver, Dodger, and the other dogs head one way while Fagin goes off on his own, which tracks with a chapter about Oliver Twist learning to become a pickpocket. He gets a demonstration while Rita sings a song about it. Now listen up, you got a lot to learn. Oh damn, some animals are dancing in the streets again. What do we do? Just run them over. These are streets At least the dogs are taking care of their new friend this time. Now, 
that's cute. So the movie version stops the song here, as I know there's a longer version elsewhere. And I should note that Rita's singing voice is provided by Ruth Pointer, which explains why her voice sounded so different here. Either way, the animals see their opportunity in the form of an incoming limousine. Inside is another main human character. This is Jenny Foxworth, voiced by Natalie Gregory, who is essentially our replacement for the sympathetic Mr. Bronlow from the book. She's under the care of her butler, Winston, who was driving the car because her parents are on vacation. Are your parents all right? They're staying longer. Oh, don't worry. I'm, I'm sure they'll be home for your birthday. No. Ah, yes. Frickin' rich people who never care for their kids. Einstein bumps into the car while Francis pretends to be the injured animal which buys Tito the time to get into the car and steal its radio. Oliver was supposed to keep watch for Tito inside, but looks like there's someone else in the car. Oliver accidentally starts the car and electrocutes Tito. Yeah. Well, that was quite shocking. The humans drive away with Oliver while the dogs berate Tito for leaving the cat behind. Now Tito and Dodger must run after the limousine while the others get back to Fagin. We shift over to Oliver, where Jenny is taking a liking to him, probably because she's always alone. Winston can't really do much about it, but once he gets home, he introduces a new character for the story. Pass me the paint and glue. Perfect isn't easy. Hi, Bette Midler. Nice to see you again. Yeah, this is Georgette, and she is vain as hell. Look at this room. She's like a tonal prima donna. Says yes, then who am I to say no? At least we get to see her Broadway skills at work. And no, she's not based on anyone from the novel. This is someone exclusive to the Disney version. At least they really hammed her up with her animations. It's entertaining, to say the least. <laughs> Anyway, Jenny gives Oliver some homemade kitten chow, though I hope that's not chocolate, because cats can't have that. She then goes off to chat with her parents on the phone, which is how Georgette is introduced to Oliver. She's not happy that he's eating from her special bowl. It may be Jenny's house, but everything from the doorknobs down is mine! Jenny comes back and reveals that Oliver can stay with her, which doesn't make Georgette happy. She needs to find a way to get the cat out of the house, but we'll get to that later. Elsewhere, Dodger and Tito report back with the others and eventually decide to find a way to save their new friend. But does Oliver want to be saved? Because it looks like he's enjoying himself with Jenny. You and me together will be forever, you'll see. Really now, this only affirms that he's better off with Jenny since living on the streets could be dangerous, especially for a kitten. That said, I do find it funny that everything in this montage is all in the span of a day. They go to the park, ride in a carriage, they already have his collar and personal bowl. Meanwhile, Fagin only has two days left to come up with the money or else he'll die to a loan shark. Anyway, the next day, the dogs decide to enact their plan to save Oliver. Since Jenny is off to school, they just need to distract Winston to break in. Speaking of, he seems to be a big wrestling fan. Slam! Oh, come on, you fool! Hit him! Hit him! Francis distracts him like last time while the others get inside and lock the door. But this is when they run into Georgette. Come any closer. I knew this would happen one day. But once Georgette sees that Dodger and friends are looking for Oliver, she immediately takes them to him. Rita is having second thoughts about taking the kitten away, because look at him. He's so cute and taken care of. But Georgette eagerly insists, so the dogs hurry up with taking him away. Hey, there's no time for long goodbyes, but uh, here's something to remember me by, baby. You ain't nothing but a horn dog, Tito. Oliver wakes up back in Fagin's ship and is confused about what happened. He wants to go back to Jenny without insulting the dogs, since they do count his family, but Dodger gets the hint and coldly tells the kitten to get out of his sight. You wanna leave? Fine. There's the door. But he just got here. Go on. No one's stopping you. Jeez, man, he's just a kid. It does look like Oliver is about to leave, rather reluctantly, 
But Fagin picks him up and stops that. He only has one more day left till Sykes' deadline, but then he notices the collar on the kitten and has an idea. Hold Oliver Ransom! I get why, but he doesn't know that he's extorting a little girl. They've kidnapped Oliver! We're going to get him back. <laughs> Meanwhile, Fagin has to convince Sykes to give him more time to get the money. What do you mean? You start with the knuckles. Ah, Fagin! Do come in, I'll be right with you. Yeah. No, you don't kill him yet. Man, this movie keeps finding ways to insert dark moments that are way too real. I mean, if I didn't know any better, Sykes is a freaking mob boss at this point if he has assassins working for him. So Fagin gets his chance to speak, but Sykes is in a giving mood once he hears about his little plan, and he sticks his dogs on him, or tries to. Dodger protects him. Get the cat back! Hey, I think there's hope for you yet. I'm proud of you, Fagin. Now, this villain isn't in the movie a whole lot, but every time he's in the scene, he makes it his own. So Fagin waits around the docks for Jenny. Ha, <laughs> he has a Mickey Mouse watch. And the little girl eventually shows up with Georgette. It takes him a while to realize that she's the one looking for Oliver, but sadly she didn't bring much money with her to trade for her kitten. At this point, Fagin decides that extorting children is a line he won't cross, and just decides to return Oliver to her for free. Sykes sees this and isn't amused, to say the least. So he kidnaps her. Consider our account closed. Well, I guess better for him to take a hostage than waste bullets on a homeless man doing stuff. Oliver wants to save Jenny, and Dodger agrees. Guess he realized that he can't be petty when a little girl's life is at stake. They find his hideout and get in with Oliver's help. Even Georgette is here because even she can't just leave her owner behind. After you, my little... Simp! Good thing none of my favorite characters simp that way. Our heroes find Sykes contacting Winston to blackmail Jenny's family. They decide to pull the big bad out of his office by whipping up a pizza man disguise. Oh, snap. A gun? In a Disney movie? And in front of a kid? Apparently, this is the first time they did this. At least with a modern gun. So, yeah, hardcore, man! Once Sykes leaves Jenny, our heroes dispatch the Dobermans with Georgette's help. They free Jenny, and then must find an escape route now that they're trapped inside his office. Yo, Tito, hot wire. Hey, no way, Dr. Man, man. Good luck, Alonzo. Huh? I'll be waiting. Hey, hi ho, hi ho, it's off to work we go. Well, they get away, sorta. Sykes is back with an axe! <laughs> this has all been very entertaining, <laughs> but the party is over. Damn, where's Ichiban when you need him? Luckily, as Sykes and his Dobermans corner Oliver and friends, Fagin shows up with his motor scooter to help them escape. They get some distance from them, but then Sykes shows up in his car. <laughs> Damn, Sykes is one crazy bastard to drive a whole car down there. Even better, once everyone is on the tracks, he shifts to second gear, burns out his tires, and essentially riding the electric rail. This is epic. No joke. He catches up to Fagin, who bumps into them, which causes Jenny to be flung into his car. He then breaks his car window just to grab her. Oliver jumps after her and gets cornered by the Dobermans, forcing Dodger to leap in to help, Leading to... <laughs> Bam! That's freaking brutal! Like, on-screen electrocution. They did not hide it at all. Even DeSoto falls over after Oliver tries saving Dodger. Can this sequence get any more awesome? <laughs> Jenny! Jenny! Damn. You know, Disney tends to make some pretty brutal deaths in some of their movies, but this one takes the cake. The only danger that came from all this was whether Oliver survived after getting tossed by Sykes, but he wakes up and is fine. We cut to another day when Jenny celebrates her birthday with Oliver, Fagin, and his dogs. 
I guess her parents didn't show up after all, but she's in the midst of good friends that she could consider family. Georgette also seems to reciprocate Tito's feelings for her, so she talks about cleaning him up. Bath! Everyone says their farewells after the party. Oliver is going to stay with Jenny, but he's going to keep his friendships alive with Fagin and his dogs. And of course, we can't end this movie without Dodger being cool one last time. Okay, so while this movie doesn't stand out at all in the Disney lineup, I freaking enjoyed it more than I should have. I can agree that the plot was very predictable and the characters were not as fleshed out relative to those from the source material, but the cast definitely carried the story. Billy Joel was excellent in this movie, in both singing and as a character. Sykes is also really imposing in his limited screen time. And Joey Lawrence had that wide-eyed innocence in his voice as Oliver to make the character likable. And while the plot might be loosely based on the original novel, I think it would have worked even better as an original story about a stray kitten trying to survive in New York. But what we got in the end was still a modestly entertaining movie. Could it have been done better? Absolutely. But as it is, it's a fun and simple story about a cat and his amazing dog friends. I'm the Media Hunter. Media is my prey, and reviewing them my way. 